Uh, here with us today is uh, Lucy, Lucy Bullivant, uh, a good friend of IAC and frequent contributor, uh, a person that has, um, uh, has written a lot about uh, the research and the project that we have been developing here at IAC. And she's a usual visitor. Thank you for being here with us, Lucy, today. For the ones that uh, they don't know, I wish to uh, read something, some short bio of Lucy. She's an architecture curator, author, critic, guest lecturer, consultant, and the founder of urbanista.org, a new webzine on contemporary urban design. This is like her uh, last uh, action, that it's a quite interesting one related with urban design and um, the latest uh, that is happening on that uh, field. Uh, she has a master's degree in cultural history from the Royal College of Art, formerly Heinz Curator of Architecture, Royal Academy of Arts in London. She has curated exhibitions for Vitra Design Museum, the Triennale de, Mil de Milano, and the British Council. And she gave conferences at Tate Modern, ISA, the Architectural Association in London, and uh, Strelka Institute in Moscow. She is a member of the Quality Review Panel of the London uh, Legacy Development Corporation. And uh, some of her many books include The Master Planning Future, New Arcadians, For the Social, Responsive Environments, Anglophiles, and more. Uh, Lucy is a correspondent to Domus, The Plan, InDesign, Architectural Review, Architecture Today, Today, and Volume. So with this short introduction, Lucy, thank you again for once again being here with us. And yeah. Barcelona, not only because the weather, the weather is so much better in London, it was snowing heavily and minute by minute we were sitting on the tarmac on the plane and it took two hours to take off. So my master plan for today is now a success, but it could have been a complete failure. Um, anyway, um, I've come here today to talk to you about my new book, Master Planning Futures. And, um, Master Planning Futures was commissioned by Routledge, my publishers, because they saw, though, and I agree with them completely, there's a huge gap in the market. Masters of books on urbanism, many by sociologists, many, many books on urban design and a lot of monographs. For example, you might know Burgos and Garrido's uh, Manzanares River uh, book, quite sort of thick book on the whole of the making of the Manzanares River project in Madrid, but scarcely anything on master planning. When I started my research three years ago, I got a number of grants, uh, by the way, otherwise I would never survived. And um, I looked, I saw one book on the American movement, New Urbanism, how to make, uh, yeah, how to do new urbanism. But I mean, really, although that movement has great uh, credibility in the States, it's only really one approach and in many, many people are, are skeptical of, of it. Um, and then there was a pamphlet on designing science parks, master plans, but nothing else. And I thought, is it that this area has become so somehow contaminated by bad feeling uh, because of maybe some of the failures of the 20th century that no one wants to look at it? Is it that the master plan is dead? Um, do we need to completely reinvent it? So anyway, I jumped into that enormous gap and started uh, trying to swim my way through all the issues. So um, you'd be delighted to know I'm going to give you the opportunity to get inside my head and the way that I was struggling with some of these issues and the critical, say, tensions that I discovered along the way. Um, it's not a history book. It's not a, a book that celebrates the, the history of master planning, although it does refer uh, in order to set the scene, you know, like uh, the players on the stage. It sets the scene by talking about some of the key master plans of the 20th century briefly. So, for example, um, uh, Chandigarh by Corbusier and Le Janere, um Renzo Piano's Potsdamer Platz, um, um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, um, Walt Disney's Epcot, because that was a master plan, um, Kenzo Tangi's uh, Tokyo 
uh, project from 1960. And I could go on, but um, the, hence the name, Futures. It's about uh, the future and, and the present. And of course, the future is contained within the present. So um, I, I didn't try to be comprehensive. That would have been an impossible task. I, I, in the end, pared it down to looking at 24 plans in 17 countries from six different continents. I didn't go to absolutely all those places. Unfortunately, I missed out very key, some key places on the ground, like, um, like New Orleans, for example. But I did my level best to actually interview all the architects, uh, get close to what the clients had said, dissect what the clients had said. You know, the, there's the, the marketing speak and then there's the sort of the reality underneath. Um, and so I, um, I think um, the, the uh, I think you could say, what is fair to say, where we will begin with this lecture is that the MOST plan has been uh, the 20th century's chief tool for carrying out um, a simple area ratio based parceling, parceling up of land as a purely top down rigid division of space. Um, living space, workspace. Uh, they, they, um, in the modernist uh, rubric of master planning in the 20th century, they scarcely ever, ever dovetailed or, or mixed in, uh, become mixed in their use. Nowadays, many cities um, across all continents are concerned with future-proofing their existences by um, committing to apparently inclusive, uh, socially inclusive, uh, ecologically um, comprehensively inclusive long-term citywide plans under uh, the heading of um, you know, Abu Dhabi 2030 or um, uh, whatever, uh, some other city 2050. Um, very few is even thinking further than that, but that is definitely the sort of the, the way in which the, the projects are marketed. Um, and many, many smart city slogans. The smart city uh, is, is very much a kind of a buzz, buzz phrase. So, um, however, if we actually look at the situation right now, the com combined impacts of economic and ecological crisis, the, way, the waves of crisis are sort of both, uh, you know, kind of overlapping each other and pushing each other and making things a lot worse. It urgently demands that urban designers understand ecosystems in a more complex way and grasp uh, not just any way of dealing with them, but credible ways of dealing with them. Um, and uh, so whether plans are really big, and here we have, well, here's a classic example of um, the uh, Constitucion in Chile after the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, Elemental were given just 100 days to, uh, to develop a remedial master plan for, for the city of Constitucione. Um, so as I, as I was just saying, whether plans are um, really big, um, Mazda City by Foster is pretty substantially, um, it's actually not so big, but it, and it's not actually a whole city, it's a district of Abu Dhabi. That's another very popular way of characterizing the master plan today, to put the word, the name of the place, and then put city after it, when in fact it's a district. Um, so whether they are uh, smart or, let's say, and this is more master Mas city, Um, or big, it's big, so big, like the new big Moscow competition um, for which OMA is shortlisted. I don't think they've awarded it yet. There are a lot of people, but the idea is to basically expand Moscow by 50%. Uh, so uh, um, just tying my in images to my text, because it's a little bit, Mazda City jumped out of its place. Anyway, so whether they're, they're big, so Kartal Pendik by Zaha Hadid Architects is, <laughs> 55 acres on the Asian side of Istanbul. Um, or whether they're 
very small interventions like soup, the uh, Turkish practice, super pool architects who proposed to do multi-story car parking structures to free up the streets of two districts um, for uh, mixed use activities. Um, I think the challenges that cities and regions are facing demand that we advance without recourse to either purely top-down aspirations that ruled in the past um, and prevail in the present. Um, uh, I think King Abdullah's business city in uh, Saudi Arabia being a very um, strong example of a purely top-down, no public consultation type of marketing-driven, commercially-driven master plan would be one example. Um, on many continents. So what type of more bottom-up thinking has agency today? Um, here's Median. Median is an exceptional uh, plan that was designed by Alejandro Echeverri, the master planner in Colombia, with his team um, that addressed the serious issues of social inequality and exclusion for the, that, it, that it, uh, the city had uh, suffered from. Um, and it's one of a few very brave plans in this, this genre um, and uh, came up with all kinds of really, really great ideas like library, whole uh, series of family of library parks throughout the city. Um, another reason, of, another factor of course is the current scale of escalation of scales of cities uh, and particularly in places like China and here is uh, Chengdu, it's a photograph from Daniel Schwartz at ATI in Zurich. Um, it's bringing unprecedented tensions. Um, so the mega, mega metropolises are growing larger and, uh, and that's exacerbating the, the, the problems. So in this situation we need adaptive design-led strategic thinking about how, how um, longer term and shorter term temporal challenges can be rec reconciled and, and to do that in a more diversified and an incremental way rather than planning for some golden future of 2050 without taking any count of what needs to be done in the, in the here and now. So um, ways to mitigate, oh here's another super pool, uh, it's just a little a bit of uh, clever mapping for Istanbul. Um, ways to mitigate the effects of these uh, tensions through urban design. They're expanding um, as interest in bottom-up adaptive planning is, is growing and I do really believe that it, it, it is. Um, but top-down thinking still prevails as I just said and it's bonded to the illusion of neutral metrics. Um, however, my view, and uh, there are many social geographers who agree with me, geographic scale is not a neutral metric of physical space, um, but it's both the geographical organizer and the expression of collective social activities. And couple that idea with the reality that we have far more digital media-enabled infrastructure um, invested as it is, as you do as students too as well, with fresh analysis, fresh research, not outdated um, uh, old, old data, old demographic data that um, has been the habit to be used in the past. And in fact, I, I know for a fact that some borough councils in London are still using old demographic data, even though London demographically is, is I mean, the the population is going up. Um, so uh, my view is you shoot yourself in the foot if you're not even using the right data. So, um, um, so anyway, so digital media enabled infrastructures increasingly open up all these vectors of reality. And um, moreover, democratic processes, um, and uh, here's a, obviously a picture of people voting even about uh, urban plan uh, and the use, use of new technologies and related social media now drives public participation, not consistently of course in every culture. Um, but at the same time the frameworks of um, regulations, and this is an irony, 
um, the framework of regulations on which many eco-cities are based, the eco-city plan like Mazda City and, and so on, actually prevent sustainable concepts happening. Um, and in a number of contexts globally, the conscious practice of master planning and adaptive planning is therefore limited. Um, because master planning involving social and economic research based on real-time data is weak and lacking in rigorous consultation with citizens um, because also a marketing-led and a very commercially aggressive vision of the city as product dominates. So um, we need to think uh, in terms of our networked um, consciousness and we need to today achieve cross-scalar social ecological resilience and that's a very important word through uh, adaptive systems we need relational urbanism that matches the way we conceive of nature now it's shifted from the tree of life as a metaphor to the web of life with things like nested systems uh, relation browsers ecosystems cloud computing and uh, the the aspiration for distributed energy systems which is still in its infancy. I mean, if you speak to an architect like Enrique Gelli here in Barcelona who designed the MediaTek, he's the biggest fan of distributed energy systems, but it's a long time, uh, it's going to be a long time before we convince all the politicians that, and indeed the energy uh, uh, providers that, that that's the way we can operate. So um, whether we are yeah, the power of networks. So whether we are in the developed world or the developing world, and my book was very careful to consider, to consider both, because I do believe in the developed world we have many, many signs of uh, traces of the developing world. You know, we have slum conditions in the developed world, and, and we can learn, an urban think tank are amazing, uh, proponents of this, I think we can learn from retrofitting the slums and we can learn from the cities where there is a substantial e informal economy and uh, the way in which that can be marshalled to um, improve the city rather than to let the formal economy smash the, 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 the human life uh, of, that exists in and around informal economy. Um, so adaptive planning has to be an interdependent approach enabling mixed programs rather than compartmentalization of functions live, live, living space here, workspace here um, with all the, those issues um, that, that um, prevail because we already have social equality so we have in Mexico City um, uh, many uh, um, you know, uh, many people who work have to travel two hours a day on buses to get to the center, maybe to be chauffeurs or um, uh, servants to rich people and two hours back again. So, because there's not enough social housing in the center of the city. And, that, and that's actually quite common in many places. So, um, here we have the urban think tank just uh, uh, thinking about how you mix functions and how you, I mean, literally looking at all the layers that are, are necessary to uh, to be marshaled within a particular terrain. In this case, in the in the uh, Grotteo project for Parisopolis, one of the chief slums in Sao Paulo, um, and uh, urbanism, if you look at it this way, is seen as inseparable from living systems. And that's why I, I really love landscape urbanism, even though uh, it has a particular definition within American academia, um, because it was, the phrase was coined by uh, the head of landscape at Harvard. But if you, if you take it away from that, their particularly specific definition and you just look at it as, as a philosophy, then you know, many, many architects people like James Corner, field operations and so on, who are in the book. And uh, here in Spain, Burgos and Garrido, who were, who were responsible for the Manzanares, Madrid, 
uh, Rio project together with West Eight. They're also great proponents. They don't like master planning. They like landscape urbanism instead, and they say it. That's the way they like to operate. So it makes landscape a basic building block as an active tissue of a socially nourishing activity. Um, and it, it foregrounds the importance of green spaces. And green spaces in cities have traditionally been places of social inclusion where all ethnic groups can go and feel fr relatively free and play and let their hair down and have fun. Um, so cities that uh, focus, I mean, here's Toledo. Uh, this is a recent uh, project, a current project of Burgess and Garrido, integrating the river Taj in the city of Toledo, uh, rather than the old-fashioned way of actually um, um, turning your back on the river, which is the case in Madrid with the Manzanares River. And now it's much more integrated in a, in a humane way. So, um, the metabolism of every city, every urban conurbation, and the, and the relationships between them, they are influenced by today's problems, which are both organized complexity and also disorganized complexity. So I, I believe that they call for an urbanist sensibility, which is um, homeopathic, if you think about the medicine metaphor, not allopathic, which is the opposite of homeopathic. Um, and uh, that is networked, which is distributed, which is localized, and which is situational. Um, so as I said, some practitioners really reject master planning as a practice, and urban think tanks view uh, Hubert and Alfredo, who, who've come to lecture here, I'm sure, in the past. Um, they're advocates of urban retrofitting. Um, and, uh, and a degree of urban acupuncture, to use another metaphor from medicine. We, they say we don't need, really need master planning today. We don't even need more new towns. And they said a master plan uh, like Mazda City um, would not have passed any democratic vote. Um, most plans today, they reminded me, are still imposed by the boards of corporations far too fast to be filtered through democratic processes. So not all plans are procured this way. And the slowdown due to the economic crisis has created this valuable space for reflection. So I argue one of the biggest challenges right now is to modify the conventional methodologies, shift the ground, and facilitate transformation and bring about a more meaningful response to global social and economic um, demands. So, um, Alejandro Aravena, who did um, Constitucione on the screen, um, he said, um, these days, the planners' planners' tools, um, and, and I argue that they're actually really, this is a really rich kit bag of, of, of potential, um, particularly the uh, sort of more recent techniques, digi digitally enabled techniques as well. He said that they are divorced from the point of the city, I mean, in the sense that there's a disconnect, because politically, um, I think the public sector is uh, held back in its power now, it's got less money, it, um, it kisses the boots of developers far too much, it lets them do exactly, them do what they want. Um, and the developers, do they really care about the point of the city? Well, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the point of the city in the first place? Um, well, the city developed originally as a system when the mass of human, human beings confronted their differences and decided to come together and negotiate and uh, create meaningful relationships. So. Um, so I think what Aravena has said is a very meaningful, meaningful point. Um, so I think there needs to be an awful lot, in, if possible, breaking down framework of regulations, which actually prevent all the progressive concepts from being realized. And there are not so many people in local government who get that point, that the regulations need to be changed. Although, in, I think in the UK, little by little, there are a few progressive steps. 
but it's a painfully slow process. Um, which it, it, it doesn't surprise me that people then do things without permission in, a, in an illegal way. And everything from guerrilla gardening, which you might have heard of as a movement. Um, so, uh, here's another one of Constitutione. Um, for 100 days, this was an incredible uh, set of documentation that resulted with a huge amount of um, uh, respect for the local citizens and actually giving them the opportunity to vote to um, an exhibition, a special exhibition center, regular presentations every week, not just to the locals but to the politicians, local and national, um, all the technical staff, all the technical people from the companies involved. Uh, so everybody was kept up to date with what was going on and, and could comment and ultimately could then vote on whether the plan had any credibility or, or, or not because they had the scope to vote it out. Um, or oh, Chendu's crept back again. <laughs> anyway, so today um, planning is now potentially four-dimensional. I mean, it is. If you include digital and geo-map space as the other fourth dimension that is part of it. So um, I think the best way of achieving adaptive system is definitely to include some self-organizing elements. Um, An Almiri, which is the, a master plan by M. V. R. D. V. for the Dutch city to the east of Amsterdam, which is increasingly taking people from other parts of the Netherlands, and particularly Amsterdam, people who find it too expensive to live in Amsterdam. Got the Dutch government is still trying to find the funds to implement the plan, but uh, it's had a long tradition of very, very experimental housing design in different districts. Um, many architects working side by side, uh, citizens can commission architects, they can buy plots, design their own houses. And, uh, and, and this uh, Almiri has a district, Osterwald, where individuals can do, do just that. And they also get assistance in, um, in funding as well. And the mechanism has been designed in a very inclusive way, which is both uh, design, maintenance, and uh, design, maintenance, and um, subsidy as well, which is not that common. It happened in New Orleans with the Make It Right organization set up by Brad Pitt. Um, but actually, the reality is, unfortunately, relatively few houses, even though they got lots of publicity. So, um, this approach to having an element of self-organization, it, 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 it brings in the idea of having a, a synthesis in the direction of the resilient um, uh, bounding together of global and local domains bounding together of the generic and the and particular relations. Um, and I, I think that that has huge merit at the moment. So the old top-down mode of master planning, and um, you have to admit that you know, Chandigarh was one of the best of the old, old style ones, um, fixating on zoning single functions. Um, I think that it, well, it, whether they, they may have been very strong morphologically in terms of formal elements, but they did have the effect of creating static and paralyzing urban conditions. And no plan, everyone, all plans have a sell-by date, and Chandigarh, there's a lot of work going on. A University of Washington in Seattle created a Chandigarh Urban Lab to uh, analyze the, the, the way in which density would is anticipated to change in the future on the peripheral areas because more and more and more people want to live in Chandigarh. Um, so the city as itself, it can't stay like, um, uh, like uh, in aspic, you know, fixed, uh, rigidly. It has to uh, change and it needs a strategy that relates to the present day that's appropriate for it. Uh, otherwise, it's, you can't just follow the old style of Corbusier plan. Um, 
So we don't want static and paralyzing urban conditions. We want urban space which has flexibility. Because in any case, I see urban space as being very relational. and con it's a, um, The city is a contestatory place. Relations are contested all the time. And so in order to negotiate layers of history, new initiatives, they need newer forms of alliances that include rather than exclude occupants of, um, let's say, the third space, as the sociologist Homi Baba termed it, the enclaves of the disenfranchised, whether on estates or in peripheries. Um, I, and I feel this acutely in London, and not just after the riots last year. I have always, always been aware of, felt this in London. So we need, we need deeper, uh, more layered forms of urban knowledge to impact on urban design so that activities can be better aggregated and local context can be connected into systems that dynamically frame mixes of ecological, social, cultural, economic patterns. So um, relational urbanism has to be something which is both intuitive and mathematically grounded. And there is this thing called parameter plans, which in the UK um, are used rather more than they were, and they are now required as part of the legal planning framework. And the merit is that they call for, they, they call for a relational understanding of representation. Um, so this, this opens up issues, has the potential to open up the issues a little bit more than in the past. And I think um, uh, if you think about the way it, breaking away from a hierarchy, there's an increased potential for um, something different, which is the framework of nature's rules. So potential of nested systems to be infected uh, by and contain change. And this thinking can influence urban design, and it is already. Um, so you've got this idea of exchange between different agencies. So although I don't show Zaha Hadid's One North Singapore in great detail, it's, it's all in the book. Um, it's, um, it's a very significant part of <coughs> Singapore. Um, they didn't conceive of it as a traditional, disconnected, suburban-style science park like a big compound in identity, but they, they basically um, uh, let it, are letting it grow within the city as a complex, aggregated ur urbanism. Um, very high, high density, but intentionally so, because the um, people working in biotechnology, uh, I think the client would like them to live in this kind of a hothouse where they're constantly bumping into each other. Which is a similar kind of philosophy that the um, uh, the um, uh, internet 2.0, all the companies dot, dot coms in Silicon Valley, always have this uh, uh, philosophy of having everybody staying in the building all day long and meeting in the cafes, and it helps creativity. Um, you may not agree that that does or not. It could be too limiting. Anyway. Um, here we have a project called um, Longang, which is um, designed by Ground Lab, who are a collective based in, in London and in Beijing, in fact. Um, the, what I would say to kind of introduce this project is uh, that, um, yeah, this is really one that addresses the issue of relational representation. Um, adaptive design. Longgang is in the northeast of Shenzhen in the Pearl, Pearl River Delta, and it's for a plan for a projected population of 350,000 people. The river has been regarded as a real backwater and a wastewater sewer. Um, through the way uh, that Ground Lab have proceeded with their, with their analysis and their, their representation, their work, um, changes in different variables, for example, like location, numbers of density nodes, um, particularities in the building catalog, and so on. They can be added into the design almost in real time 
evaluating the effects of different massing options and spatial arrangements so that further discussion about the urban fabric and architectural qualities can be put forward during the decision process. Whereas in the past, um, you pretty much didn't have that degree of um, speculation possible. So here we have yeah, parametric models of potential scenarios. And by the way, my book's not a textbook for the, the whole sort of tech side of master planning, but I try to delve into it enough so that people feel um, that so it's very kind of tasty morsels and they can then go off and um, research it a little bit further. So um, another, yeah. There's a lot of material for this project. I, I tried to avoid drowning all, in all the visual material. Um, another very key project that I studied for the book, this time uh, in Milan, the, on the, uh, which relates to the urban, peri-urban and regional scale, is the urban development plan for the Milan, led by Metrogrammer, who are one of the finest um, pl practices of the younger generation, specializing in master planning. Um, it took its cue, uh, it started a few years ago, but it took its cue from a project that was developed spontaneously without fee by Land, the Italian-German uh, landscape architects called Raggi Verdi, um, an environmental strategy um, which linked the city's green belt to each of its urban districts um, with a system of green rays um, connected by a, two by a network of cycles, pedestrian paths, like rays from the center. And uh, it uh, completely epitomizes this idea of urbanism inseparable from li living systems, with landscape as its basic building block, um, uh, and as an active tissue, as I said before. So that and the city's voids become uh, open-hearted spaces instead of uh, closed enclaves because I think there's a lot of I issues around the world about urbanism developing in terms of closed enclaves um, quite how you get around that I don't know you mean the prevalence of shopping malls in, um, in Latin America or uh, I've just been in Bangkok and they have ever more community malls and somebody said to me well you know why we like these malls because you know walking on the street you, you get real high exposure to the air pollution, we feel a lot more comfortable inside the mouths. So um, although Enrique, Bo Enrique um, Penalotha, the former mayor of Bogota, is somebody who's absolutely stridently against shopping mouths. He hates what they, the effect they have on the city. But uh, again, there is this ecological issue of uh, avoiding air pollution, although instead you get air-conditioned air, and so maybe one is no better than the other. Um, so um, eventually the city council, the me metropolitan government in Milan, uh, were so inspired by Raggi Verde, they decided to actually go ahead and commission the urban development plan with a group of people, Metrogramma, but also ID Lab, who are in fact interactive designers um, who did an, uh, have done a really clever piece of research on um, uh, social data and computing and um, it's, it's all explained in the book. It's very, very complex to, uh, to say very quickly. But um, in a nutshell, I mean, the scheme is um, it's very multifaceted and it's also got in its heart, as part of it, the multimodal transport infrastructure plan for adjusting the more traditional way of Milan's um, layout. But it's really a reconceptualized, re reconceptualization of Milan because for so long it's had nine admin zones built over, up over centuries. And um, talking to citizens in neighborhoods, the research team came to realize that these no, no longer really represented present day reality in the post-industrial city of Milan where there are wishes for more housing and all kinds of uh, uh, demands and desires 
uh, articulated and less articulated. Um, so instead, the reconceptualization has created um, uh, the city as a networked lattice array. So instead of what was a traditional hub and spoke plan, you know, like a bicycle wheel, um, a universal wheel pattern that's actually quite common. So instead, there are 88 new, relatively small neighborhood definitions that are, re are based on uh, local lived identities today. Um, with, the, as I said, a layer of transport network. So altogether a permeable uh, network interconnecting the whole city and its region in a much more satisfying way. And, uh, oh yeah, this is just, if you can read the two lines at the top, that's, that's me trying to explain in, in uh, um, two sentences what ID Lab did. Since then, there's been a change of government, and the new uh, mayor and uh, local government have said they still want to go ahead with it, but they want to put their stamp on it, so they want to change the thing. But in any case, it has to, whatever, this, something as ambitious as this could be just done incrementally. Um, hopefully, they will not throw it off the track. So, um, yeah, and, and, and uh, if they do, at the same time, learn the lesson that um, uh, Risanamento, one of the, the, there are not so many property developers in Milan, actually. Risanamento, uh, one of them had a very ambitious plan for Santa Giulia, one of the industrial areas, uh, turning it into a mixed-use uh, zone. Um, and commissioned Foster to, to, to do the plan, and Westgate to do the a big green lung in the middle. But it, they didn't manage to get sell enough apartments by any means, and the whole financial model cr crumbled, and they were flogging, trying to sell the apartments for a third of the price. The city council looked at what the mess and pulled out the, took their convention centre plan out, and uh, and it it's now turned into a um, a really rather. Dis depressing uh, location uh, like that. So that's a um, potential future plan. Um, this is more of the Raji Verdi, Raji Verdi material, which as a study of, of a, a post-industrial city in Europe and uh, its uh, potential in terms of the role, active role of landscape. I think it's a beautiful one. And AIDA's gallery in Berlin uh, made an exhibition with a catalogue which you can, you can uh, access and uh, check out. Well, and of course, in uh, two years' time, Milan will actually host the Expo, which uh, is actively, uh, the theme is, um, is very much about the, the living city in terms of uh, urban agriculture and nurturing the peri-urban areas of Milan, which are, in fact, have a lot of farms, which are now, st many of them are struggling for their existence, for their livelihood. Uh, so I, I hope that the all the ideas that were seeded through the Urban Development Plan, the Raji Verdi, um, uh, re more recent work that's been done on um, the peri-urban areas. I, I was a tutor on an architectural association visiting school in Milan with um, Claudio Pasquero and Marco Paletto, who is here today teaching. And uh, we studied that very, very uh, topic. So, um, bearing some sim similarities, but now on the multinational scale and, and up in Scandinavia, is um, Big's Loop City proposal for Copenhagen. Well, actually more than Copenhagen, it, because it actually wraps in a massive great necklace. Um, well, it combines uh, uh, Sweden and, uh, and Denmark together. 
So whereas, um, whereas in, the 1940, in 1947, uh, the, the, uh, the Danish um, urban designer, Steel Isla Rasmussen, conceived of a finger plan um, for Copenhagen, connecting the suburbs of the city to the center, uh, Loop City um, d does it, plays it differently. Its cross-border connects the two countries through a ring which, through the means of a light rail of 11 highly differentiated urban nodes around the Sund region, um, effect quite positive change. So in total, they occupy the same space as the entire city. The ring is similar size to the San Francisco Bay region, and it includes work clusters and has strategies for energy exchange, waste management, water treatment, electric cars, stations, in a clearly what is a centerless uh, metropolitan region envisaged by big as a focus for very dense, sustainable, recreational development of the entire region. And in a, in a weird way, you can see the fact, it, this is actually a, um, a perfect example of what I mean by networked urbanism, that, that perhaps there can be an interdependency between all the elements of, around the necklace or the ring, um, that they actually support each other. Um, and through the countries, countries break down those sort of nationalistic uh, boundaries that we are so often, um, that create so many problems for people in different countries. So um, everybody remembers, um, we well, might have forgotten him by now, but Nicolas Sarkozy, I mean, he's, he's not president anymore, but um, a few years ago, yeah, in 2008, there was um, Sarkozy stage Le Grand, Pal uh, Le Grand Paris, a competition f for 10 proposals by international multidisciplinary ur architecture and urbanism teams. Um, the great thing about that, although actually nothing ever got realized, uh, was that it did actually foreground landscape urbanism, not in the American uh, academic sense, but um, in the sense that I, I define it, um, and I think it's useful. Um, he asked them to diagnose and to envision the future of City of Paris 2030, again, you know, holding on to that, that, that imaginary that date in the future. It was, um, uh, it was a subject of great debate and some wondered whether his initiative was actually about decentralizing the whole of the Paris region. Um, but there were some really great responses. Um, one architect, instead of doing a master plan, he took all the small intervention plans that he researched that were ongoing in the city of uh, the region, greater region of Paris, and he mapped them all together into a single diagram. So for the first time, people, through this new piece of infographics, inf representation, uh, people going to the exhibition that was held could actually read that, all of that, what were disparate activities, as one whole activity, and see the connections between them. And then uh, Yves Lyon, who is an architect, he had the Descartes team, and he, he amassed all the available um, interstital urban land, so all the bits and pieces in between that no one really want, know, knew what, knows what to do with in the Paris region, there are 263 hectares of it. Um, in fact, more than two and a half times the uh, surface area of Paris itself, in fact. Um, in fact, all the teams, interestingly enough, focused on making the best of these underdeveloped areas, especially those used by railway tracks along waterways and along on the edges of parks. Um, and so Descartes, the team, they tackled the governance issue, um, you know, the, the quality of governance of urban design in Paris in a similar way to Metrograma, in pointing out that Greater Paris is equivalent to um, uh, 20 mid-sized mid towns. 
and proposing new, much more sensible territorial divisions that um, people on the ground could relate to. In fact, what happened is that um, although Sarkozy was very rhetorical and he said he really supported a change in, in, in philosophy of urban law to support this idea, the plan was already, uh, he did, whether he knew or not, I don't know, but it was hijacked by a very top-down transport plan prepared independently by um, one of his ministers, uh, reversing earlier decentralization plans. And then um, it, it had a southwest green loop for a French Silicon Valley. Um, you can see everybody seems to want a Silicon Valley. Um, Mo Moscow is already, uh, has already developed one. Um, um, we're trying, the, the British government is trying to make uh, the tech city in London and so on. You can see the attraction obviously in the crisis. Um, so it was essentially for very high speed connections between future economic development poles. And um, it actually got voted in. So all these arch architects' propositions got pushed to one side. But then the regional government had its own idea and came up with, uh, came up with something else. And the national government, the regional government, sort of carried on arguing with each other and um, ended up with a kind of a compromise. Um, and none of the architects' projects got implemented. But let's say the, the value remains in terms of the, the ways of thinking. And as a model, you know, this, these are models that can be built on by other people inspired by what they did. Um, so what scope is there? You could say to yourself, is there any scope for creative intervention at the large scale? Um, on one level, the answer to that question is simple. You know, it's whether the politicians really uh, care enough to change policy and go with, go with creativity. But in fact, one of the largest projects ever featured in the book, which was commissioned and is supposed to be going ahead, is uh, for uh, Sangamon Island City in, uh, um, by ARU, Architecture Research Unit in London which is 400 meters square land uh, reclamation project on the west coast of the South Korean peninsula. So it's unprecedented in scale. It's roughly two thirds the size of Seoul, Seoul, the capital. And it's intended to house uh, up to one million people at densities of up to six, 60 dwellings per hectare. That's not very high actually the, in the Olympic um, the legacy master plan for the Olympic Park. Um, in fact, there are going to be five. There are going to be five uh, residential districts. One of which is already advanced quite far in uh, in planning. Um, is something like 600 dwellings per hectare. So, I think that's quite low scale. But it, it reflects the very the. Um, <clears throat> the, the very nature of the land, which is effectively kind of like a, a new island. Um, it's, uh, it's also near transport hubs. So I would say, yes, it's a water city um, which has a great proximity of functions and programs. It's not a tabula rasa in the utopian sense, but it's a city lacking single function zones. So in that sense, it goes against the tradition of conventional Korean, uh, South, uh, South Korean practices, which favor the zoning of the modernist city even, even now. Um, but at the same time, obviously risk leaving out the sort of the, the fun and the uh, enjoyment of diversity. So they proposed six new islands to be built within the freshwater lake behind the seawall. Um, they stress the relational aspect of the spaces in their design. Um, and they related the islands to water bodies that they'd already seen and admired and photographed in Europe. Um, and each one they made, uh, this is the, the scale of, actually they've relate, this plan is, relates to, they've put, They've overlaid the plan of Sengamon um, over a part of London. So unless you know how big um, 
you, you know these places and you know how big that area is and it's not helpful. Um, but uh, um, it is pretty amazingly big anyway. <laughs> um, so what I was saying was that each of the islands is, uh, is, is walkable. It's a width of uh, 40, you can cross it within 25 to 40 minutes. So it's not just this enormous endless pancake of terrain. So um, one thing that's really fascinating about it is that they chose a number of um, city elements from various other places in the world, ranging from the Therda city block in, in Barcelona from the 1850s, the Dockland city block in Hamburg um, from 1885 to 1913. They, these could be squares, gardens, streetscapes, or skylines, and they're made up of buildings of similar type, flexible in use, but, but not use-specific. So it's within these, the city structures begin to deal with the uncertain future and evolving nature of the city. Um, the food clusters have a food industry um, that they want to develop in, in this place. For example, um, and uh, ARU noticed that traditionally that sort of industry tends to just be allowed to grow like in an additive ad hoc way. But so here, they're part of, um, um, they allocated it to like a university campus model based on the quadrangles of Oxford and Cambridge University. Now you might say, well, oh, sorry. And you might say this is just taking other models from other places and slapping them down in South Korea. Why are they doing that? But it's actually not so literal. It's not taking, it's not uh, pastiche, it's not reproduction. It's just using them as inspirational models. Um, so the grid of the dimensions I've said as Barcelona block, which is non-hierarchical with a lot of variety, um, they juxtapose it with a small grid that derives from the London Muse block, those little streets with um, small cottages and uh, room for cars, but not much. So the ordering principles become flexible and they are searching for spaces which have a civility. So they have a, an, a strong identity. They're not copied, from, copied and pasted. pasted. Um, they have a sense of time and a sense of shared, uh, shared qualities. ARU fall into the category they reject master planning as a practice because they say it's so definitive and it disregards temporal uh, aspects. So, and to get around, they, they say, um, to get around this idea that you make an urban design plan and then it goes out of fashion or um, the, the, the people get bored with it, um, they apply, a, the design tool that they apply is landscape infrastructure, that's what they call it. Um, the first being a collective phenomenon, landscape being a social condenser, and the second, of infrastructure being about the in-between. Um, so I like the way they position themselves. This is a long way away from the American New Urbanism movement, where, which um, their attitude to history is really just to copy historic models of density with plans that really lack uh, fresh readings of, very specific readings of history, of places based on history, culture, and geography as part of the studies. Um, and new urbanists presume, they, they take it for granted in their head, as the social theorist David Harvey has said, that spatial order can control history and process, which, which it can't. Um, just to be really, um, give you another contrast, um, another architect, Teddy Kruth, who actually doesn't really come into my book very much. He will be in the follow-up. Because I, I, now I started this thing, I think I, there's still such a lot of really brilliant adaptive planning work being done. And um, particularly, um, maybe the next one even has, um, uh, maybe even has um, student work in it. I don't know, I haven't can decided that yet. Anyway, um, Teddy Cruz is uh, Guatemalan. And um, he has concerned himself mainly with the micro scale of neighborhoods. Um, 
as what he calls a micro laboratory of the 21st century on both sides of the San Diego Chuana uh, border because he prefers to create instrumental concepts and what he calls scalable templates which adapt to changing uses of spaces. So drawing on existing physical and urban traditions and on patterns of occupation and interaction that can rework the, the limits defined by, so transform the limits defined by rigid zoning and planning laws. So uh, what the way he sees it, as he said, instead of uh, going on looking in terms of buildings per acre, he puts forward the idea that you help to generate economic, social, cultural transactions per acre. Um, that's not just purely like um, slick real estate deals, but that's basically people trading with, with each other and um, sharing space and negotiating and um, creating, a, let's say, a cultural fabric that is viable, that people can have a livelihood, make a livelihood from. So, yeah, nice graphics, really, really brilliant graphics. He's designed a whole mediatory political process for a pilot housing project in, in California as well, because he, he works uh, in a number of locations. Um, south of the border, actually, where is San Isidro? I'm, um, I put it down as California, but I think it's just north of the border of um, San Diego. Anyway, together with an NGO, Casa Familia, uh, they have sought to bring about political, economic, and social transformation by having monthly workshops with the public. So through discussing and challenging local conceptions of building density, community, communal space, and financing, he has tried to redefine housing as precisely what I said before, nested scales of interaction. And maybe this shows, the, some of these diagrams will show you a bit more uh, what I mean on political, economic, and, um, um, hold on, <laughs> political, economic, and, There's a bit more of my lecture, which I can't see here. Um, um, interaction. So I, I'm just looking for the end of my lecture. Um, can you just hold on one second? Because I seem to be missing a few pages of, just the one page of notes. Do you? Uh, yeah, would you mind checking upstairs? <laughs> Sorry. I'd love to be able to remember the end of my lecture, but unfortunately I can't. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we're nearly done, but I just uh, would like to keep the end in, in and not leave it. Let me show you another. So, so the so this is a diagram showing the, the housing for senior citizens t um, together with childcare facilities within the same uh, within the same uh, building. And um, oh, brilliant! Oh, thank you. And. Uh, and in these, obviously, these are various applications of multi-use over time um, with different typologies. And, uh, oh, yeah. So anyway, this has led to him incorporating alternative zoning categories relating to the city's density and, and citizens' income into the plan. So I think, there's definitely a kind of uh, shifting of the ground there, which is a really valuable type of fundamental 
uh, design strategic thinking, uh, the art of organization, which is absolutely what architecture needs to be and uh, only architects and urban designers can do. No other profession can do it. Um, I always say that because a lot of people like to downgrade the professionalism of architects as a way of um, pushing their fees down, which is really bad practice. Um, so just one other uh, scheme I want to uh, flag up briefly, very quickly, because uh, this one continent, I mean, I uh, don't have time to talk about every continent, but in uh, Johannesburg, um, urban design has been carried out in South Africa for a number of years as part of the developing of, of development of existing and new urban areas. But as a discussion, it hasn't really been taken very seriously in the re restructuring of cities. So as a result, the challenges of urban sprawl and of dormitory townships with huge areas for residential but not mixed-use purposes are omnipresent. <coughs> um, and in the post-apartheid era, this is a really kind of fundamental thing to, to think about. The theories of urban design thinkers like David Crane and Kevin Lynch and the work of the new urbanists have actually been really influential in triggering processes for mixed use and helpful ways to integrate uh, people, a user's lifestyle and more transport-oriented urban design, which are really vital because of the huge distances that workforces, workforces have lived from the center of cities. Um, one um, big ve a vehicle for addressing a huge backlog of social housing needs has been um, the mixed-use Greenfield Cosmo City Extension 17 in Johannesburg. Michael Hart, who, the architect who is responsible for the framework plan for Lion Park, is quite a campaign, one of the best campaigners in South Africa for a more progressive approach to uh, master planning. <coughs> and he's challenged consistently uh, the, the existing standards for building suburbs which continue over and, again, over and over again to dictate car-oriented car planning, in spite of the fact that car ownership is really low, because uh, we're actually generally talking about people without an awful lot of um, um, available income. Um, and secondly, they've traditionally neglected alternative energy solutions. So he wants to remedy these short-sighted approaches, get away from the classic notion of a, of a piazza, which uh, this is also a thing that the traditional developers like to have, in favor of more local, culturally-based spaces <coughs> that have more, um, uh, in a way, they're, they're actually more resourceful for, for local people. Um, so he's also keen to push a design-driven, not an engineering-driven housing development, again, the, the, the balance shift at the moment is too far in the direction of engineering-driven schemes, um, which can then be used to create infrastructure plan. Um, so he wants to create um, communities that work at higher densities, but without having high-rise developments. Very smart, really. Um, so he created his own little family of criteria for um, for, for operating called S-E-E-E-D-E, -E, Social, Economic, Environmental, Design and Engineering Criteria, matched to real demographics um, to create pedestrian-friendly precincts, um, and here they are, integrated mixed use, which were, have been influenced by, there's a Dutch concept called uh, von, Vonuf, Vonuf concept of roadways which are shared with public spaces. Literally, they're living, called living streets, and they enable social space for children to play, nighttime gatherings, um, parties, and uh, whatever you want, workshops, and uh, community meetings, um, which have centrally based parks as well, with social and community buildings around them, and row housing, 
And by doing all of this, avoiding having this potentially isolating, sprawling, suburban, typical suburban tapestry of Mac, Mac mansion type dwellings that, uh, you know, we had, we've had all of that in the past and it somehow doesn't really suit the, the people who really live there. Um, so it was a real challenge for him to get the planning authorities to understand that car ownership in this area is really low. So the amount and the width of the roads should be changed anyway to make them more pedestrian friendly. Um, he's, a, you know, the, the normative scale of, of an elements of suburbs he's against. It's really hard to get the government to understand that the settlements must be upgraded in an incremental way rather than just demolished and placed elsewhere, which they would like to do, more convenient to just get rid of them. Um, and it's sensitive to existing communal networks set up between small businesses and houses, which is also really, really important. Um, again, you know, proximity is vital um, to, uh, to, to build social equity, basically build resilience of communities. So his framework acknowledges the inability of the informal settlement dwellers to compete with the informal economy. So he proposes commercial retail trading facilities and waste to energy businesses. And it places um, activities spines, as you might see there, close to um, to uh, business hubs and next to pu public transport and a mix of strategies to boost uh, environmental capital, including urban agricultural schemes. Uh, more recently, um, he has created another one for Slovo in the township of Coronationville in western Johannesburg. And here, yeah, that's one, that one, here, um, is trying to address the needs of everybody in the informal sector. So aligning urban markets, urban markets here with, um, with public space so that everybody can, can um, play, a, play a role, play an active role. Um, and have, there's connectivity with the neighboring suburbs and an orientation to pedestrian and bicycle use over car use. So, open source architecture. I want to finish this um, very detailed, um, uh, but actually in a way quite a hectic tour through some of the themes in my book by uh, discussing technology just a little bit because it, I think, um, for me to have said all the things I said already, but let's say no more about technology, would be somehow missing out a really key part of the picture. Because as you will know very well, in the last five years, there's been tremendous innovation in the intersection of pl urban planning and technology. And their relationship now needs an, another book of its own. Um, we can make open spatial, spatio-temporal spread models that can now simulate everything from human migration, weather, human ideas, um, to, as a convergence with different types of data, including what is called uh, social dynamic area atlases. And all of these phenomena can create a much, much better speculative understanding of the city. I mean, di digital navigation now is such a hot issue I mean, just remember all the fuss that broke out uh, in the autumn when Apple parted company with Google Maps and tried to make its own map applications and then they malfunctioned so everybody was um, being directed to the wrong place or um, McDonald's in the center of, a, of, a, of the Duomo or something like that. It was uh, really chaos. Um, anyway, Fortunately, they, they are resulted. Um, and I think there's going to be more and more investment in this area. Uh, the thinking behind the conceptual thinking behind it, obviously, is something that um, comes from 
should come from the heads of architects and interactive designers as well as the software engineers. And one key issue that comes for me when it comes to modeling and technological innovation um, and the emergence of what I call the hyperlocal is that we can now ask um, whose scale are we talking about? Um, who owns the big scale or the small scale? Because open source um, uh, technologies and social media um, make scale also a really big issue of citizenship. It's not as I said at the beginning, it's not just a matter of neutral metrics that can be used um, uh, in a manipulative way to sell money. So crowdsourcing, uh, mapping, social networking opportunities, which the internet allow us, um, help to generate participatory planning technologies. And um, I think you know there is clearly a new three-dimensional geo-referenced approach to landscape design and environmental, environmental engineering which has very fine scale spatial data relevant to, to such design. It's routinely available as um, 2D GIS, geo, GIS geographic information systems linked to 3D uh, CAD packages. So new technologies are both an aggregating and an accelerating uh, factor in urban planning um, our, our, the, the way we now use in our patterns of behavior, social infrastructure of uh, digital media, it changed obviously our perceptions of space, personal, local, global, spatial relations and time. And also the sense of transparency too, which at the same time ironically reveals how, uh, how out of date all the planning. It shows in a very stark light how out of date all the planning orthodoxies are. Um, we know that local governments embrace and like the idea they can use big data. Um, I know of at least one borough council in London which um, has all its data but it keeps it on an Excel spreadsheet. It has not yet given it to any um, urban designer to, uh, to, to be more creative with. So while it stays in an Excel spreadsheet, it's not um, maybe up to date, but it's not doing anyone any, it's not helping to inform the creativity of urban design and city. So um, urban think tank who are always quite amusing in the way they see things, they said, well, why, why do we still imagine cities based on grids when we have uh, GPS and GPS has liberated us from that, uh, um, for example. And then on the other hand, you have to remember the smart, smartness is fallible. So your GPS can break down, um, as Neil Gershenfeld, who I believe is consultant, is he on the council here? Neil Gershenfeld from MIT? He's a friend of Vicente Guayot, anyway. Um, he, he said, I think at one point he said, I wake up, woke up one morning and my smart house had crashed. So again, the smart city could, could crash if, if it's not uh, dealt with properly. Um, so we have um, a lot of very interesting uh, new activities like Stamen. The uh, designers create all these um, updatable uh, maps which people themselves can go on the internet and update and customize, customize maps. Um, world mappers uh, on the net, they reveal the disparities between the developed and the developing world. Um, Google Earth, but also the green map systems, which are used by um, environmentally advanced community agencies. Uh, around the world to document green spaces, biking paths, endangered habitats, mm -hmm. um, bringing a hyperlink dynamism and enabling a wider, more comprehensive comprehension of place and its resources. So we have a lot more, um, we have a lot, many, many more uh, lenses at our disposal and ways of looking at things. Uh, I also um, I love terrain layer, for example, which uses digital, digital elevation data. It's an open source answer to 
Google's terrain layer. Um, as I said, local governments um, here and there already know the potential of um, big data and uh, the, of GI, GIS-based software and so on um, to somehow integrate virtual reality with scenario design and impact analysis and policy simulation and so on. Um, but I think it's really the beginning of very, very, very much the beginning of, a, of an era. And uh, as I also said, they're very short of money these days. So um, it could be that the um, commercial software developers make, make all the running, but hopefully the local governments will somehow still be able to play an active creative role, role in this. So, um, so, okay, so urban design needs to operate evolve its operating system as a physical digital threshold, embrace a non-hierarchical interaction framework like the web, um, but also continue to generate community consultation. And, uh, in, and also you probably notice that there are techniques of engagement which all sorts of people like MVRDV and so on have evolved, like one-to-one, -one, like public games, uh, not one-to-one, -one, but also physical digital interfaces. Uh, in this case here, po po Polypoly, based on the, the uh, well-known board game Monopoly by the London Architecture Practice, AOC. Um, so I think that um, adaptive plans, in summary, that favor landscape urbanism, um, such as those by Burgess and Garrido, uh, as I said, a practice who dislike the, uh, perhaps the totalitarian associations of master plan, master planning, have to be the answer. What, what are, and there, there is Madrid Rio, what are the barriers then? Um, I think you can, be, you, you can be clear from what I've said that there are huge numbers of barriers as well as there are huge numbers of creative opportunities. Some people would say that the uh, advances made in the world, which are globally uneven, they're not, not the same everywhere, by neoliberalism. Um, and if you read the urban theorist Neil Brenner, who teaches at GSD Harvard, um, he now reckons that neoliberalism is in its zombie phase. There's a very nice, quite amusing, very complex little pamphlet published by the AA which actually analyzes neoliberalism and, uh, and the way it works in relation to uh, the significance for urban designers. And I picked it up and I thought, this is so hard, I can't cope with this, but I pursued it and realized that actually um, it's absolutely central. If you understand neoliberalism and the weird way in which it's operating, then you, um, you're ahead of the game. Um, so uh, neoliberalism is antithetical to urban sustainability science as it needs to be practiced in the 21st century and translated into socio-spatial terms. So we have a dominance of transnational globalization. Globalization obviously has had huge benefits of information transfer and e educational um, uplift and so on. Uh, at the same time, you have got a lot of cities over-referencing each other and copying each other and so on, and the, the whole phenomenon of cut-and-paste urbanism, which I really, I really dislike, as if the idea that you clone places, um, you're going to solve people's urban growth imperatives by cloning uh, your, your city with some other place. Um, all of that goes to push attention and the business of building re local resources away from precisely the local and the, and the, the valu valuable uh, space of the local which needs to be nurtured. So in um, um, conclusion, I would say then absolutely it's not about the rigid blueprints of the old, 
but it's about integrated, loose-fit frameworks designed as evolutionary generative systems which have adaptive capacities for the intelligent differentiation of place. Um, a process which has an awareness of the layers of history, of, of memory, and of community-focused desires that is advanced in, in a way which is really consistent and, and represents rest, reciprocity with community plans. So, um, uh, as Daniel Burnham, the uh, urban designer of Chicago, uh, always used to uh, insist, make no little plans. Uh, the question is how you make them. So I believe that agency and framework can mutually inform each other and be resilient and benef beneficially interdependent, not weak and dysfunctional. And this process does require um, social equity and it calls for transparency in terms of local needs for in inclusive housing, jobs, working spaces, amenities, um, high quality accessible green spaces um, and overall environmental economically sustainable strategies of benefit for all. Um, that, that's not a little plan, that's a very massive tall order but I honestly believe that um, uh, there is the capacity of urban design to, to achieve all those goals. Um, so I you know, I've kept in touch with, with, um, with all the positive trends and, uh, and phenomena and uh, I hope uh, master planning is quite a complex process to explain so it is quite time consuming but I hope in my lecture I've given you a little bit of a kind of um, ta uh, taste uh, of, of, of this whole terrain and that, that you can um, perhaps um, have a look at my book and uh, and consider the, the, you know, what you think the actual uh, role of master planning, adaptive planning really is today. So thanks very much for uh, listening. So, here we are. Thanks very much, Lucy. Yeah, it has been very interesting, so stimulating, very inspiring for, for us as architects. Um, in IAC, we actually uh, work a lot with um, the idea of the um, uh, sense city as a sensitive organism. Mm -hmm. So the possibility of a city to get uh, information through senses and get real-time data yeah. that can modify the use of the city, the use to um, project the city. Mm -hmm. So it's really something that uh, it's a uh, hot issue here in IAC and we really are looking forward to see some of this um, experiment uh, in, in your next book as yeah, well. <laughs> So thanks very much. Uh, it, it, does anybody has got some question for Lucy, taking advantage of her presence in here? I think everything was really clear and in any case we can consult your book. <laughs> so thanks very much and let's have some kava.